everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, Deploy, the Microsoft Defender for Endpoint Environment uh, and the uh, learning live session here at Ignite. Uh, my name is Joseph Raleigh. I'm a senior technical specialist with Microsoft covering our state local government accounts. And also with me, I have uh, Jackson. Do you want to introduce yourself real quick, uh, Jackson? Oh, yeah. Uh, great. Uh, I'm Jackson Felden, Microsoft MVP, and working as a consultant for Avanade. My day today is to implement uh, some complex projects, including Defend for Endpoint. I'm really happy to be here to share my kind of day-to-day -day experience uh, from what I've been learning and implementing out in the field. All right. Thanks, Jackson. Uh, with that in mind, also, there's the QR code, and you can follow along with the modules that we'll be covering today in today's session. So if you take a quick scan or if you can highlight the link, uh, you can get over to follow along with us when we're, uh, when, when we're presenting. Additionally, uh, let's say hi to our moderators. Uh, we have Ken and, well, I think we just have Ken with us today. Um, He's going to help us go and moderate uh, the questions. If there are any questions, feel free to go and throw them into the Q&A, and he'll help uh, surface them up to us, or he'll help uh, go and provide the answers for them. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm getting a message that the slide is stuck. So yeah, actually, yeah, actually, I was about to say, yes, it hasn't moved. It hasn't moved for you. Let me... Let me stop sharing and reshare my mm -hmm. screen real quick. At least this isn't a Teams presentation. <laughs> um, all right. So does everyone see we should be at the uh, deploy the Microsoft Defender endpoint uh, slide? Yeah, I can see now. Yeah, looks better. Yeah, maybe try to move to the next one to see. Let's go for it. Hmm. Let's try it again. Oh, uh, yeah, learning it, objectives. It moved. Yeah, now it's right. looking good. Yeah, excellent. All right, so we are we are in business today. Uh, I'm going to back up to this other slide. Here's another chance to go and scan that same QR code. This again will take you to the module here. Uh, the intention or the objectives for today is to really go and cover this particular module. And so we're in this module. We're going to create a Microsoft Defender for Endpoint environment. We're going to onboard devices and configure devices, or at least we're going to share that knowledge with you. Now, this is a 60 minute uh, a breakout session. And between the two of us, I think Jackson and I have probably closer to 40 years of deployment uh, around Microsoft solutions. I know that I've personally been at close to probably about 300 Defender for Endpoint deployments and all the various names that it's uh, it's had all the way back to Windows Advanced Threat Protection. So we have a lot of history, so feel free to go and fill up that question and answers with uh, different questions. This module is really designed for an entry level, uh, 100 level um, course. So I'm just saying the expectation here, while we do have a lot of shared knowledge between the two of us, we are going to be covering the basics in today's session. So let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> um, and for everyone that can, I want them to start to go and ask some different questions. Make sure, feel free to interact. Uh, I know that you can't chat with us, but you can put in inside the Q&A. You can go and do all the all the fun things uh, and ask all the questions. And so feel free to inundate Ken with as many questions as you can come up with. All right, so the introduction here. Uh, deploying Microsoft Defender for endpoint uh, environments involves configuring your tenant to onboarding your devices and configuring security team access. Wow, it's a mouthful. It's not a whole lot of uh, excitement right inside of, in there. So uh, I did, before my session started, I did spin up a new environment. Uh, and I wanted to go over a few things uh, real quickly here. One thing I should caveat here, <clears throat> we have 60 minutes to cover probably four hours worth of content. Oh, and maybe more. <laughs> it, it might not even be that much. And then I know that personally, both me and Jackson, we can go and talk for an hour on each one of the tick boxes that we're going to go through. So we're going to go as fast as we can possibly go. So it's going to be like watching YouTube on 2x speed here. So I apologize for that, but you know maybe you can uh, look at the session afterwards and you can slow it down. So this is where you're going to start, or ideally this is where you're going to start. And so if I want you to picture inside the space, you're a new administrator. Someone just came down and handed you down a set of instructions saying, Good news, we just bought Microsoft uh, E5. Now go deploy it. And you're scratching your head like, what on earth am I gotten myself into? This is where you're going to start. 
it is fairly straightforward, but there are a little gotchas along the way that we're going to try to call out or we're going to try to highlight as best we can in the time that's allotted. So this is the portal. You can see up here the securityportal.com, or sorry, security.microsoft.com. <clears throat> Microsoft is notorious for changing names. And so I want you to start calling this your Defender Portal. In fact, if you go into defender.microsoft.com, it will redirect to the security.microsoft.com. But the new portal name is now def the Defender Portal. So just get used to that. You're going to see it's just going to, we're just going to call it the Defender Portal and all the rebranding and all the different things. So if you've watched the rest of Ignite, You've probably heard some of that. There are probably plenty of jokes that you can come along with with how many different name changes we have, but that's just what we're where you're at. Some little gotchas or just some little tips and stuff. In terms of figuring out what licensing you have, and that's usually where you're gonna to have to start because inevitably you're gonna go into your portal and you're going to be like, hey, I don't see my licenses. I don't see the same thing that Joe has. So there's two ways to go and check your licenses real quick. If you go to your Azure portal, Inside here, you can go and type in licenses. I've already done it, so it's right here in my list. And then you're going to go see all products. And then you'll see the products that are listed. So I happen to know that E5 is where I'm getting my entitlement from. If I click on it, it'll show me my users. But the specific thing that you want to look at is the service plan details. And this will give you all the things that you have, including Defender for Endpoint. And so a lot of times it comes down to, you know, there's Microsoft 365 business, business premium. Uh, there's a dozen different SKUs and different things that have license entitlements to it. So this is one way you want to go and see Defender for Endpoint. And that is what we're going to be talking about today. The other more common approach, you can come into your admin.microsoft.com portal. You can go into underneath billing, you'll see licenses and you'll see something similar and you can get to almost the same details when you come into here. You can kind of see what's available, but I personally like the Azure one because it gives me the detail, it gives me this detailed service plan, and that's what I'm usually after. You can also hit this via PowerShell if you're interested in, in those types of things. Anyways, this is the portal. This is what you're looking at, and what we're going to have you do is you're going to go into settings, you're going to go into Microsoft 365, you're actually not going to go into Microsoft 365. You're going to come into here and you should see endpoints, which you clearly don't see. I don't, I clearly don't see. And this is a very common. Uh, so the very first time that you come into a portal, into an environment, it, it has to prepare for you. And so this is exactly what, why I set up this environment is because you'll be looking for things and they won't be where they're supposed to be. And so you'll have to click on it and then you should see something like this. This usually takes 10 or 15 minutes, but that was intentional. So you would see what that would look like. This is my real demo environment. And when I come down to my settings, you can see when it loads, what I was trying to take you to. And endpoints is ultimately where you wanna go. Now we're gonna come back here and visit this. We'll see if it completes in enough time for this to spin up. Like I said, it takes about 10, 15 minutes. Almost all of these underneath settings, uh, when you go into settings, so identities, so that's Defender for Identity, if you're licensed for it, Defender for Cloud Apps, uh, the email side of things with Defender for Office, all of them need some time to configure. And so if you're brand, brand new, you've never gone to any of these environments, give yourself some time to allow this to go and do it. And in fact, when you're setting up some planning time, you have to build your own lab environment, just expect that you're going to go and click and wait for a few minutes. I know we like to think that everything inside of Azure or everything inside the cloud is instantaneous. The reality is the resources need to be spun up at the back end before you can actually view them uh, inside of those different spaces. So, uh, back uh, to uh, our Joe, I think it's uh, interesting to explain. Usually, the questions, the the question we get is in regards to where all the telemetry data security oh. is stored, and very yeah. important for how long is that stored and available for the clients. I, I think it's better is a good idea to explore a bit on that. Absolutely. Well, that's a great question, and I'll show you where you can go find out in your own environment. Uh, the answer is 180 days is mm -hmm. the default, um, and so that is how much is visible inside your portal. And then additionally, you have uh, accessibility via the advanced hunting for 30 days. And so you can query against data that's 30, 30 days old, and then 180 days will be visible inside the portal when you go back and you take a look at uh, different things. Um, and additionally, where the data is, well, 
Partially that depends on when you set it up for the first time, you're going to go and see where your data rests. And so some of this is going to be, sorry, uh, some of this is going to be determined where, when you set up your, your Azure environment, exactly where your component uh, uh, rests inside that space. Mm, so, all right, so inside of here, so if I go into settings, and then Microsoft 365 and under my account, you can see here that my data is at rest in the United States. Here's my tenant ID and my organization ID. Those are those are common things if you need to go from a support perspective where that will come from. Um, yeah, Joe, but, I think if you could zoom in a little bit, it would be better for, for, for the audience uh, to see. Yeah. So this is yeah. where you're going to go. So it is in settings. And then the general account information, and then you'll see right here, it'll tell you that your data is stored in the US. There's a couple data centers around the world. If you happen to be in a government account, you'll see something that says US mod or US uh, high or DOD. So different data centers will have different names, but it will tell you kind of the country of origin that where, where your data exists for that particular product or for that particular service. Um, okay. Let's see here. All right, we're back to uh, back to this. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, we're talking about creating the environment, which we've kind of seen in real time. Let's see if that's actually completed. I don't know that it has, but we can take a look. Uh, we're still we're still loading. It's still moving. So that is your your real world experience. What you would see. All right, well, let's take the moment to go and talk about what is Defender for Endpoint. And because there's a couple different components there that I want to cover. I think a lot of times people will just say Defender and they will mean a specific component inside of Defender. And I think a lot of times this gets us into trouble because if you're asked to deploy, deploy Defender, if I can speak today, if you're asked to deploy Defender, I think the assumption is you need to go and deploy all these things and configure all these things. You, however, may not be an expert in all those things. And so you need to have a strategy to be able to understand, well, hey, who is going to do this? And so where we start off with is what actually makes up Defender. And there's a couple key components inside of here. One, we have threat and vulnerability management. And so this is the capability of being able to detect whether or not uh, software is up to date, whether or not third-party software is up to date, or your operating systems are up to date, and if there's any known vulnerabilities for those particular environments. This includes firmware and a few other things. There is attack surface reduction. So this is around the idea that uh, I want to go and configure my device in such a way that is going to be more resistant towards attacks. So an good example would be, do I have USB controls in place as part of attack surface reduction? Because USB ports are an attack surface. Controlling them would be an approach to go and, and, and manage that. Next, gen, or next generation protection, this is a fancy way of saying antivirus. So if you follow Gartner, this would be your EPP, your endpoint protection platform. This would be what is going to detect my malware. So if I put Locky on my device, what do I expect to happen? Do I expect something to go and stop it, and prevent it, and then quarantine it and do all those things? And that's where this particular component comes into play. Endpoint detection and response, this is the bread and butter of Defender for Endpoint. This is where... It has its origins in terms of being able to take the telemetry from your machine and understand that this is what an attack looks like. This is an adversarial set of behaviors or tools or techniques or processes that are running. And because of that, I can make a determination that what is happening in your environment, this is you know something evil that needs to be blocked. A good way of thinking about this is, the next generation protection is going to go and prevent things that are known malware. So ransomware, binaries, things that have known evil code in them that we know about and we're going to stop and block them. Endpoint detection response is more about the behavior. So someone has pulled up PowerShell, they've run some commands inside of PowerShell, they've done some things with uh, tampering with credentials, or they've gone and done some reconnaissance to pull down information from your domain controllers. Those things are suspicious behaviors. Those behaviors will alert the system to that there's something going on and we want to go and erase some alerts around there. That's the main difference between the two. They absolutely go hand in hand. When you think of an analogy, 
This is like a sensor, like an alarm sensor on your front door. So when you open it, it gives you an alert and tells you, hey, the front door is open. And this is kind of like a camera that has a motion detector. And when it sees suspicious behavior, someone's going into the refrigerator at night and stealing, you know, your cookie. Um, that is something that is 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 part of that particular uh, scenario of what it would detect. The automation portion of it. This is automation investigation remediation. This is part of Defender for Endpoint plan two. Uh, so there's two different, there's a P1 and a P2, uh, but this is part of the plan two components inside of here for uh, automation uh, to be able to go and take uh, uh, automatic response capabilities. So we want to be able to go and when we see these things, specifically this thing over here, endpoint detection response, we want to be able to take an immediate action and automate not only the removal or prevention of that, but then also we want to be able to go and uh, do some other capabilities around responding to that. And then the last piece that we'll just brush over is Microsoft Security Threat Experts. This is a little bit evolving and changing, so I won't get into a whole lot of details, but think of it in terms of I need to go and escalate. I see something in my environment. I need to be able to go and, and get an extra set of eyeballs. I want to go and see what it takes a look at. Of course, beyond the scenes, there's an API set of uh, layers of being able to access this with the security graph and the components, and all of this combined makes up what Microsoft says are XDR. And so we can see the XDR of what uh, what this looks like. Uh, yeah, Joe, just to uh, just to add, it's interesting to see how Defender for any point uh, on the previous slide you show works in uh, kind of together in, in uh, out when I was implementing uh, Linux, Defender for any point. Uh, and then eventually the Defender AV uh, status was uh, in passive, and even in uh -huh. passive, the the EDR managed to to understand a, a, a bad behavior from an application and then block a malicious uh, code. The AV was was down, and the EDR managed to catch that and, and block. They kind of work all together to enhance the whole security. Absolutely, Microsoft for a long time has preached around a layered defense system. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone can tell you that they block something 100% of the time. And I will say that all of them are lying, including ourselves. <laughs> there absolutely needs to be multiple sets of detections mm. that go and be able to detect and go and prevent that from happening inside your environment. And that's exactly what we have here. There's multiple different opportunities to catch the attacker in the act and go and prevent that. And that's what we've configured here. And that is around the best practice around making sure that uh, that happens. All right, so I need to rush through the rest of my slides so I give Jackson a few minutes to talk because I am I am running a little bit uh, behind here. So we've already gone through create your environment. You can see here the security at Microsoft.com and that is being changed to defender.microsoft.com. That was just announced this uh, this week at an, earlier on at night. But just be aware, right now they redirect between the two. So for if, you, if someone asks you this on a test, security.microsoft.com is the answer. But in six months time, just expect to be going to defender.microsoft.com for all the things. All right, network configuration. So <clears throat> this is part of the module that you'll need to be aware of. If you have a server environment or if you have an environment in general that doesn't have direct access to the internet, it's going through like a proxy or has a, some sort of, uh, you know, you need to be able to route the data around there. You need to make sure that there's some URLs that are allowed to be able to go and to talk through. And there's a whole proxy configuration. We won't get into the details. I think the important thing here is if you're doing something in the network to go and whether you're looking at traffic, you're inspecting that traffic, or you're not preventing uh, outbound traffic to specific areas, you need to make sure that you have some allow list or exceptions in place. I've put in place the aka.ms forward slash MDE URLs. Um, so it's a plural with an S. This will take you to the document that has all of the URLs that you need to go and allow to go and have uh, unfederated communication with the Microsoft services. And if you're in a government environment, you'll see that there's one for the GCC environment as well, and that will go through all the different things. I think these are really important to go to. Even if you don't have that situation, go to the URL because it shows you all the running processes. It shows you all the names. It shows you all the directories that all these things live in. And so you can get some education around what, uh, what and where and how these particular processes work and how they're defined. 
All right, now moving into configuring your environment and the advanced features. Now, this isn't terribly exciting. If I go here, here's you can see a screenshot of it, but now I'm going to go to my uh, portal. Let's see here. Do I have my, this is my, this is my, uh, we're back to this environment. I'm going to turn on my mouse pointer, hopefully. Let's see. Yep. All right. So hopefully it's big enough for everyone to see. I've tried making it a little bit bigger so everyone can see inside the screen. Um, just real quick, I'm going to go into down to settings. Underneath settings, I'm going to go into endpoints and then advanced features. And so in advanced features, when this loads, this is going to be after everything is configured, this is where you're going to come in here and toggle all of your configuration components. Now, we're not going to go through every one of these. I wish we could. We there, I could probably spend a couple hours on just going through each one of these settings. There's a few callouts that I think that are pretty obvious. Tamper protection, it should always be on, at least in a production environment. So you want to turn this guy on. Um, I would say that most of these things are things I'm going to turn on inside of an environment. There's a few exceptions. One of them would be this exception, the restrict correlation to within specific scope devices. This is something that I wouldn't do by default. This would be something for very specific use cases. But overall, I'm going to go and turn on the vast majority of these. It's important to go and turn these on early in your development because you don't want to have to go and have a change control to go and turn something on six months after you've deployed this and gone, gone live. So come in here and configure all the things. How I approach this is I've created a, a checklist of all the different you know, settings that you can come into. And so when I'm setting up a new environment, I come in here and I go and I put in little you know, check boxes around all these things, what I'm going to enable. And I save this and I say, okay, well, I had this turned on in this environment. I had this turned on over here. I had this configured here. Oh, here's where we have these components over here. And so I document this as part of my onboarding process whenever I go and do a different deployment. And so that's something that I use to be able to make sure that I can go and you know match different environments or I set up everything in the same way for all the different groups. It so is these important are all to remember that that configuration applies for the tenant and applies for every single device as a kind of a back-end service configuration. Later That's on, a... I will show how to how to push some specific configuration on the endpoints. Yep, no, 100%. These are all global configuration settings. They, by default, have to be made by a global administrator or a security administrator, but they are absolutely something that's going to impact every user inside the environment. Um, and that's also why it's important to configure it from the get-go as opposed to waiting six months after a production environment. Um, all right, uh, let's see here. Uh, this is one of the callouts uh, because of the training module, but live response requires automatic investigation to be turned on before you can enable it. So live response is one of the features inside of Defender for Endpoint. So live response allows you to go and have a shell into a machine that is being managed by MDE to allow you to go and do some additional uh, you know, troubleshooting or not troubleshooting, additional forensics information around that particular machine. So there's a few things that have dependencies between each other. That's why it's important to document it. Uh, and like I said, we can go into some of the details. If there's questions about a specific advanced feature, definitely feel free to put that in the questions. All right, now quickly, we're going to run through the operating systems, and then I'm going to hand it over to Jackson. Um, so this is a pretty generic slide. What operating systems or what platforms does Microsoft Defender for Endpoint support? And the answer is all the main ones. So Windows, Mac, Linux, Android, and iOS. We do not support um, you know, AIX or Chrome OS or a few other variations out there, but any major platform that's on a device is supported inside that space. Now, in terms of Windows, what do we support inside of Windows? Pretty much anything that is supported by Microsoft. There are a few things that aren't supported. So you can see I've highlighted in, in gray things that require uh, extended support agreement in place before we'll even take a look at it. There's also a caveat that they don't, the older operating systems don't have the same capacity or capabilities as a newer operating system. So there's definitely some functions and features that don't work inside of like a Windows 7 environment, but we can support it if that's inside your environment. Now, this cheat sheet, if you go to aka.ms forward slash MDE Windows, 
you can get to the actual reference material that has all this documented in here. And so if you take away one thing from the slide, the aka.ms forward slash MDE windows, that is what you want to go and, and take a look at. Each one of the operating systems is going to have an AKA. AKA.ms is just Microsoft's internal URL shortening link that we control. And so you'll see that a lot of times if you're not familiar with it. All right, uh, Mac OS. Again, MDE Mac. So if you go to the AKA website, you can see there we support the same platforms that Apple supports. Apple supports the last three generations, which is Monterey, uh, Ventura, and Sonoma. Um, does it work in Big Sur? Absolutely. We do support Big Sur, or I should say we work in Big Sur, but Apple doesn't support Big Sur. So because of that, then it's not really something that we support either. And so if the, op or the owner of the operating system doesn't support it, you know, we really can't be on the hook for it, but it will run on like Big Sur. Another question that I see a lot of times is like, do you support M1, M2, M3 processors? And yes, we do. We have ever since Big Sur. Uh, Linux, I'm not going to read the whole list, but again, if you go Yeah, to we are AK, running a little bit late, uh, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> .ms uh, forward slash MDE Linux, you can see all the, all the platforms that are there. Um, Android, the big call out here is Android 8 and .higher. Again, whatever Google supports, we support inside that space. And then uh, lastly, for the iOS, it's an, or iOS 15 and higher. This always changes whatever Apple supports. That is where we support inside that space. Lastly, if you go to the MDE platforms feature, if you go to this AKA, this will give you a breakdown of all the different features and functionalities that are available across those different platforms. I think this is the most useful or reference there. This is a screenshot I took off of the actual web page just a few, a few hours ago. But if you go to the AKA link, you can go to there and you can browse There's a long list. This is important to go and take a look at all those different things. Now with that, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Jackson, and talk about onboarding devices. Okay, yeah, great. That was a great intro. Let me hopefully just share my screen in here. Screen should be this one here. That's... Okay, just a second. Okay, I believe you can see my screen now. Is that, is that right? Yes, we can see you. Okay. Anyway, um, when it comes to the when it comes to the the, the uh, device onboarding, the devices they don't pop in into the portal just you know out of the blue. There is a procedure to be done in order, as you can see, as you guys as you can see in here, to bring the device. And then we can see the two important uh, two important status in here if they are fully onboarded or actually this is a really useful feature uh, devices that can be onboarded. Anyway, now on the next few slides, I need to just show how is the process in terms of kind of bringing all those devices Joe was explaining can be Linux, can be Windows, can be Mac or so on. But before I explain the, the, the process itself, I want to explain this really interesting feature called uh, the device discovery. Because of course, security is everything and we don't want to end up having some kind of forgotten devices out there, not onboarded and fully protected via Defender for, uh, Defender for Endpoint. To do that, there are two places for us to do the configuration. The one is where Joe already explained into the, uh, the the advanced feature. And the other one is if I go here to the portal into security.microsoft.com and then go to settings and then under the device discovery. If I click in there, yeah, there you go. Here is the, here is the place. Usually it takes a few seconds. And to be honest, the, the configuration is very simple. As you can see in here, we have two options to set oops, to set as a basic or a standard. A standard I'm, I, is the recommended because I want to see and detect any device with the log for J2 detection as well. Uh, if you are not comfortable in terms of ha uh, having all the onboard devices scanning the network and kind of providing the list of other devices that can be onboarded. Interesting feature is this one here, where we can actually decide, um, uh, uh, just select 
a few of the devices that will do the scan on our network. And then, of course, if you are looking to onboard, let's say, to detect all the devices, I should have at least one devices on each of the network. Okay, when this is done, and then as I have my lab here ready to go, and here I have a couple of devices already onboarded, but they have a big list in terms of other devices that can be onboarded. The interesting thing here is I have the export button. Okay, from the export button, I can just click and export a list. And then I will end up having a Excel file like this, where I can, uh, you know, where I can find all the devices' name, uh, names. And then from here, just one second. Oops. Uh oh. Okay. So, uh, okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, bit bit of glitch. And then in here on the Excel, now I could filter to find out exactly the, the devices that I should be onboarding in the future. Anyway, just a, that's a quick in, intro in terms of the devices that can be on. Uh oh, did we uh, lose you, Jackson? I. I think we may have lost Jackson while he was uh, while he was configuring it. <clears throat> we'll give him just a second to come back here. Um, so let's see here. We were just talking about device discovery. So bear with us, and I will see. All right, we'll give Jackson another minute here and then I'll take over and I'll try to run with it here. All right, I want to go back to my screen and we'll we'll talk. Oh, Jackson, are you back now? Sorry, guys. Yeah, not sure what, what, what's happened. Really sorry about that. Let me just share my screen again. Uh, just lost. Um... You were you were right on the configuring device discovery. Yeah, slide. exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you guys see my screen again? We can. Okay. Um, so, sorry. What was the last slide that was explained about the uh, 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 this slide here? Uh, you were you were actually back on twenty eight. Was the last was where you locked up on? That's ah, where you were. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Really sorry about that. Uh, did, did I show the configuration live or just a slide when I went off? Uh, we did see like the Excel document uh, that you were working ah, okay, on. Uh, okay, sure. that's, yeah. that, that's fine, yeah. Okay, anyway, uh, yeah, sorry about that. Now the next step is when it comes to, uh, we now want to tackle those devices that were identified in our network. And then really the place to go is not too complicated. Again, back to the security.microsoft.com into settings and then i need to dive into the endpoints and then from here if i just go down into onboarding yeah there you go here is the place now where i have all the different flavors if i want to onboard windows 10 i just need to click in there uh, if i look into onboard some uh, windows 12 uh, sorry 2012 and 2016 and here and then what i need to do i still need to explain this bit is just download the um, the script and some operating system like 2012 2016 i need to uh, download the package as well and yeah that's the place in order to just double check when the devices are onboarded, I, I really don't need to do that for every single device, but and then I can run this PowerShell script just to create an alert and that will kind of populate into the portal to see if all the telemetry is working, is working fine. Better than that, now let me just go back to this. I need to share my screen again. Right, let me just go to full screen. Okay. Okay, now this slide here is important for you guys to understand. When it comes to the operating system, for Windows uh, Server 2019 and later, and Windows 10 and 11, the good thing is the antivirus and the EDR are fully built in into the process. 
This is why, uh, sorry, into the operating system. This is why when it comes to do the onboarding it is not too complicated. I just need to run a simple script and then job done. After, you know, anything from five to 15 minutes, the devices should be populated into the portal. When it comes to the server 2012 and 2016, it's a little bit different. Server 2016, as you can see, the AV is the Defender AV is built in. Don't need to be worried about that. But the EDR is missing from the operating system. And server 2012, there is unfortunately pretty much you know nothing. This is why the difference we have when doing the onboarding is the following, as I was showing in a few seconds. When it comes to all these let's say latest version, very simple, just download from the page I just showed, download the script, run the script, job done. When it comes to server 2012, 2016, I need to install this MD4WS MSI, is around 150 megs, install that as a client, and then after that, I'm free to install the, the run the script to get everything sorted. If you are wondering how actually you can run the script or if you need to onboard hundreds or maybe thousands of devices, of course, you need to look for any sort of automation. The good thing is Microsoft doesn't kind of you know, stick with a single method, makes very, uh, let's say, open, and whatever works better for you, you can use in terms of uh, doing the onboarding. For example, if you're just doing your own lab, you want to onboard five or six devices, just run the local script and job done. If you want to scale for dozens, hundreds, or thousands of devices, whatever works better for your organization. There are scripts ready to go for you to inject into the grow policy and basically do the onboarding via grow policy. If your organization is already using configuration manager to manage all the devices and patches and so on, no problem at all, use that tool to do the onboarding. And the same story if you are using Intune, uh, VDI and so on. Uh, interesting enough, if, if your organization is using or is planning to go to the Defender for Cloud, there is a nice integration between Defender for Cloud and Defender for Endpoint. And then by the time the devices are, uh, let, let's say, part of the Defender for Cloud, usually takes one hour, one and a half hour, they will be auto onboarded into the Defender for Endpoint as well. Uh, before you ask, if eventually you actually don't want to have all the devices onboarded into the Defender 4 endpoint via Defender 4 Cloud, there is a virtual machine a VM tag you can add on the devices to avoid that uh, auto onboarding. But anyway, these are the methods okay, you need to, uh, to use when doing the onboarding for Windows devices. For Mac, for iOS, and for um, Android, you know, there are different methods, but when it comes to Windows, this is the place, you know, to start. Very important is the following. If you are onboarding fresh new devices, to be honest, it's not complicated at all. You know, deploy a new server, deploy a new Windows 10, Windows 11, run the onboarding, job done. Okay, no problem at all. But if you are doing the migration, if today we are using a third-party AV, whatever is the vendor, and now you are you decided to migrate that AV into Defender for Endpoint, and then there is a process you need to you need to follow. What you need to take in, in, in consideration is the following. Yeah, here is pretty much kind of a standard. Make sure the, the devices are fully updated. The, you know, of course, the team uh, is um, already up speed when it comes to Defender for Endpoint. As Joe already explained, make sure the devices, they can reach the backend service via proxy or via FIRO. Okay, that's kind of the, the prereqs you need. Now, very important is the following is before doing the onboarding, you need to set your devices as passive, okay? Of course, I'm talking about uh, more about servers now, because if I have a third-party AV already running on my device, running as active, doing all the, the protection, if I just bring out of the blue Defender for Endpoint in active as well, I will end up having two, two AVs in active mode, trying to kind of, you know, could be fighting each other to look after all the security. 
the good news is if you are talking about Windows 10 and Windows 11, there is a, a mechanism that do the detection. It means by the time you onboard a Windows 10, Windows 10 can detect uh, the uh, third party AV and then Windows 10 goes, sorry, the defender on that Windows 10 goes to passive. It means I have active third party, passive defender for endpoint. By the time we remove the third party AV from the system and then defender takes over the machine and becomes active automatically. Unfortunately, if you are doing that for, if you are onboarding servers 2012, 2016, 2019, I'm, I'm running a complex enough project at the moment, and then we need to do that manually. What I need to do is basically follow this registry key, okay, to force every single server as uh, passive, and then I, of course, manage the setting. I need to push the setting. I still need to explain how to push the, the AMD settings locally on uh, uh, each device. And then I do the onboarding. At this time, I have third-party AV active, Defender as passive. Okay, and then after that, I'm free to uninstall the, uh, the third-party AV. And then finally, my Defender for any point now becomes active. In summary, the procedure I've been using, again, for thousands of servers I have already onboarded in workstations as well, is the following. First, if you are doing a migration, onboard as a passive, and then what I've learned is, it's a good idea to wait 24 hours to give time for all the telemetry to be fully synced into the portal. We want as well to make sure all the Defender for Endpoint platform, all the AV definitions are fully updated on the on the kind of you know local device. And then after 24 hours, we simply remove the third-party AV. Now I'm sure telemetry is fully synced and the, the device is in a good shape where you know I'm, I'm expecting for that. And then I remove the third-party AV and set Defender as active. That's the, the process I've been using now and is working well. It's a bit of more control on servers, as I said, but that's a way, a right way to avoid gaps, avoid problems between two AVs running together and minimize any security gap by the time you remove the AV and install a new AV. Anyway, there is an interactive lab in here. I will skip that. We can post later on the link to go into the interactive lab. And then if you want to have a quick look into Defender for Endpoint, but you don't have you know, some VMs, some devices available to do a, a proper lab, you can do the lab simulator where you can kind of you know, just follow the, the, the process and click. And as the name suggests, it's not real, but it's a good simulation for you to start into the Defender for uh, Endpoint, let's say, world. Of course, maybe it comes a time where you need to remove devices from the from the from the system. Okay, and then there is the same place where I went to download the onboarding script. There is a place where I can download the offboarding script. By the time I run the offboarding script and run actually that the, the script into the devices, the first thing that happened is the telemetry are not going to be sync any, uh, synced anymore from the device into the server. Defender for any point is still running in a local device, in this case now as a standalone, but all the connection between that device and the, the backend service basically is stopped. Uh, hey Jackson, nice. what, happens to, yeah. what happens to the data that's already been collected? Oh, that's a very, that's a very good question. Yeah, usually clients ask this question. Of course, the good thing is uh, the data is still in the portal because if, you know, 30 days later, 60 days later, we need to have a look, I don't know, maybe go back to that device and see, uh, get the, the, inform the security information, it, it will be there. And as Joe explained before, by default, the information stays there for six months, 180 days. And then, of course, after six months, and then the data is uh, deleted if this device doesn't come, let's say, alive anymore. Yeah, anyway, good question. 180 days, the information is still there. Yep. Hey, uh, okay. Jackson, just based off the time, do we want to jump to like the MDE settings deployment uh, section of things? Yeah, uh, I of, think so, yeah. Things? I will. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, anyway, the, there is. 
Yeah, there is a, a place where we can set uh, groups. OK, one minute here, and then I will jump straight because that's very important where we can uh, create groups and then I can kind of segregate my my uh, devices per based on names, based on OS versions and so on. And to give us better flexibility when it comes to do the, um, you know, the management in the future. OK, very important, as we, uh, you know, Joe point out, is how actually can we deploy the MDE settings? Because one thing, let me just uh, one second here. And then, yeah, just one second. Yeah, OK, yeah, very important is when we are talking about the specific settings, AV, you know, uh, how what's the frequency? I want the Defender for any point to get a new AV definitions. I want to run uh, a daily full scan or quick scan. Uh, do I want to scan network drivers? Yes or no? There are dozens or even hundreds of settings. We need to deploy those settings to the to the endpoints. Uh, there are again, Microsoft made our makes our life easier. Eventually, if your company is already using Grow Policy, you can push every uh, single of those devices via Grow Policy. If your organization is using uh, configuration manager, no problem at all. You can use that. Or, of course, let's say I would advise to try to stick with the cloud where we can use Intune or we can use the endpoint security policies as I will run a quick demo now. Just before I run the demo, uh, yeah, this is just a quick info in regards to the grow policy. All the configuration is in here. Dozens and dozens of settings, very flexible. We can set uh, in there. Same story, if I'm looking to set the configuration via Configuration Manager, again, all the, the settings are there to be pushed. Let me show uh, how I can do that in the cloud. If I go back to my portal, security.microsoft.com, uh, I need to go, let me just start uh, in here. OK, this is the place endpoint security policies. This is quite new, I need to say. Microsoft brought that, you know, a few, a few months ago. Now the beauty is I can go to a single portal, security.microsoft.com, and have everything, you know, I need from here. In order to create a new portal, uh, just I need to click in there. Here now I need to select what's the platform. At the moment, from here I can support Windows 10, 11, and servers, Mac and Linux. If I click on Windows, now I can, from here, create the policies for, for example, the AV, the defender, uh, the exclusions. I want to skip when the AV is doing the verification, the attack surface reduction, and so on. Just to show how you know it looks like, I already created the AV global policy. If I click in here, the interface is really nice, really user friendly. I can see now straight away, I have already four devices affected by that uh, policy. I can click in here and check exactly what are the settings I'm pushing to, to those devices. I can double check what actually are the devices under that policy and have a quick report in here if the configuration was deployed successfully or you know if there is any error i can spot it straight away from here of course these uh, policies we can from here assign to a specific user uh, so, uh, sorry to a, a, a specific devices or all devices users and so on okay that's the way we can push the the configuration again you could uh, have a single policy to kind of a standard policy to push for you know every single device on your organization or you can create multiple policies and assign to multiple multiple users yep. okay the next thing i want to show is uh, yeah i don't need the slides anymore you know really nice is the following if you are looking for, you know, OK, how can I know the state of my devices? If there has been any kind of incident, any alerts, you know, created and so on. From here, I can easily click on the device itself. Now, of course, I'm looking at a single device called Windows 10 uh, 22. I can click over the incidents and alerts. As you can see, not looking really good, but has been a few ransomware, let's say, cases in here. If I click here, yeah, WannaCry, you know, was uh, remediated. That's good news, remediated. If I click in here, I can see now what 
is the whole story what's happened you know with the uh, with that attack in here i actually know now yeah one of our users called alex w run the wanna cry uh, payload from here but the good news is the following Thanks, this machine is fully protected via Defender 4 endpoint. I can see the remediation was done um, successfully, and the you know the the, the bad application here was uh, moved to the quarantine. Okay. And the last thing before we move, we have some tough questions to ask you to ask you guys in a few seconds. Is the following? As Joe uh, kind of presented the first slide. Defender for any point is um, AV, EDR is, you know, is, is, is a bunch of things working together. And part of that is the threat and vulnerability management. From here, we can have a very good understanding where is our state when it comes to security. Two very important um, scores in here are the exposure score. And, you know, 31 is not that great. It's a bit above, you know, the, the, the low. This goes up and goes down. If you have missing uh, patches, the, the, the exposure will go uh, up. If you are running, you know, applications, uh, old applications, again, they have vulnerabilities, and then the exposure goes up again. If you are wondering, of course, the magic uh, magic question is how can I bring the score down when it comes to the exposure? No problem at all. I can click on improve score. If I click in here, now I have visibility of all the tasks that should be done. For example, I really should update Google Chrome. There are some .NET framework here missing as well. There are some Windows 10 running without updates. And the good thing is I can in here, now click, okay, let me see what are the devices running out of, you know, missing some updates. I can click here on the expose devices and now straight away, of course, I have, you know, a single lab here, but from the export, I could now have a full report. What are my 158, for example, devices that I should really um, implement the, the, you know, that missing, missing um, uh, patch. The other score is the following, very important as well, is my secure score, device security score. 55 definitely is not that great. And why is not that great? I can see there are some security controls missing, accounts I should make some improvements, networking as well. Uh, here we are expecting, of course, to have something 80, 85, more is better. Again, if I'm wondering how can I improve now the device secure score, no problem at all, magic button, improve your score. If I click in there, now is more when it comes to the, 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 the settings I should implement in order to improve the score. For example, I should onboard all of those missing devices, the, the detected devices not onboarded yet, I should really onboard. And then there are a bunch of things in here I should implement from uh, here, I can see. I haven't enabled the attack surface reduction controls. I have enabled only three rules. There are 17 at the moment. And then this is why kind of, you know, bad enough configuration, but uh, this is why the Defender for Endpoint managed to collect all that uh, telemetry and then eventually as, you know, bring all that information together and give a kind of a good direction for the clients. What are the tasks that must be implemented in order to, very simple, to reduce the exposure score and of course increase the device security score. This is what we really want to do. Anyway, that was all about when it comes to the uh, what I was explaining when it comes to the, the vulnerability management and so on. Now we have a few, not sure, Joe, you have anything else interesting we could share before we go into the, the, the quick questions? 
Well, um, I know we just dumped a lot of uh, a lot of things on everyone that was listening to us that stuck with stuck it out, uh, and we also only have I think six minutes left yeah. before we we get through here. So let's start with the first questions, and if we have a little time left over, we can fill up the air because I know I had some questions to go back and ask you. Yeah, but I, was, I know that we were both trying to get through all the content or as much <laughs> of it as we could. So it's a race against time over here. Um, all right, so how this works, if you haven't gone to it before, go ahead and scan that QR code. It's going to take you to a poll to mm -hmm. answer this question. And so once you answer that question and you lock it in, and we'll give everyone a few minutes while we do this, um, you'll get the answer, and then we'll 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 check up, and then we'll we'll show you the answer here in just a minute. So we'll give we only we're only going to ask two questions. We're going to give maybe about two minutes per question, and then we'll move in. And then the last one will be give us a, your rating, your feedback. Tell us, let us know how how this is going. If this was useful. Mm -hmm. um, I know that Jackson and myself really enjoy and appreciate being able to do this. So your feedback really drives, you know, some of the content around here. I know that personally, I would like to see some more higher level uh, content to, you mm -hmm. know, some go be able to go a little bit more in depth around some of these different concepts and some of these different things. So with that, the first question, default data retention period for Microsoft 365 Defender is what is it? Yeah, the questions uh, are coming. The answers are coming. Uh, yeah, the, the answers are coming. All right, good cool. thing. Yeah, the big majority, I think, is getting right. Well, let's hope so. Now we've worded it the way the default retention period. You used to be able to go into the portal and configure yeah. it yourself, and that is no more. It is when we say default, it's pretty much kind of the static. Um, you can open a support case and you can get it adjusted a little bit, but 180 days is the max amount of retention that you can go and have yeah, inside. Yeah, there you go. Here. Most of the people got, got it right. Yeah, well done, guys. So it's six months. So try to trick you with putting in a month versus a day, but uh, 180 <laughs> days, six months of the same thing if you look it up. All right. Okay, let's, let's go to the next to the one. Next question. Yeah, I explained quick enough, you know, that question. Hopefully, okay. you guys were not too tired and managed to, to catch. I, I, I think if you know how to take Microsoft test, you can rule out uh, some, some quick possibilities here inside of here. But uh, uh, which of the following options is a valid Microsoft 365 Defender for endpoint onboarding option for Windows 10 devices? Is it A, group policy, B, the Microsoft Store, or C, a generic installation package that you could deploy? Um, and so this would be the last question that we asked that has a poll registered to it. Um, so some of the other questions while you guys are answering, and I think Ken might be putting in some uh, some things into the chat, but uh, so you mentioned the scenario where you've you have a there's a third party antivirus that's installed. Mm -hmm. Do you see or have you seen any compatibility issues with going and putting Defender for Endpoint alongside uh, another antivirus product that's running? No, actually, that's a very good question. No, but uh, every time when I when I'm start a new migration, a key thing to do is to go to the third party AV and add Defender for Endpoint as an exclusion, and then go to the Defender for Endpoint and add the third party AV as a AV exclusion as well. And then, yeah, if you pay attention on that procedure and then do, especially for servers, manage the active passive. Yeah, as I said, I have onboarded thousands and thousands of devices. And based on my experience uh, so far, so good, I would say. Yeah, no big headaches on that. All right. Um, Ken threw into the question into the chat room. Uh, can we revert back uh, revert back ransomware encrypted endpoints back to a healthy state from the console? So that's an interesting question. Uh, the answer is uh, no, you cannot. There isn't a recovery that would mm -hmm. take you, that would undo it and wrap you around there. Um, there are some other things that you could do in terms of like ransomware prevention and mechanisms, yeah. and hopefully your data is in one drive and has version control and those components. But like a, a live rollback to be able to go and automatically recover is not part of the scenario. Windows 10 and Windows 11 have some built-in functionality that they can restore themselves or reset themselves but the actual like reloading the image or a captured image as part of like a, a part of the scenario is not something you could do through our defender portal yeah that's a, re a really interesting uh, question and uh, yeah, as Joe said, unfortunately, we don't have that uh, capability. But what we do have is we can create some automation. And then by the time uh, th there are multiple alerts, we can set, for example, the device to be fully uh, isolated automatically. 
based on yep. you know so different criteria. So we is more a kind of to have some automation to prevent the ransomware you know before it reaches the, exactly. the devices the, or express. The, and in that case, it's, it's preventative. There's also yeah. preventative to make sure it doesn't spread to multiple devices. But uh, all right, let's ask. Okay, let's answer the question the here. So the the answer is group policy. That is right. Group policy is one of the scenarios that Jackson ran through. Uh, and covered inside there. There are a plethora of ways of configuring and deploying Windows uh, Defender for Endpoint. Um, group policy is one of the methods. It's one of the methods we use pretty frequently all over the place because it has the most availability across all the different things. That's correct. Um, yeah. There is right. no, as I, I think I said, there is no right and wrong in terms of what tool you should use. Is more, you know, whatever is more suitable for your environment. All right. Let's keep moving. Let's just jump on to the, I think the the final uh, the summary, and then we can go into uh, we can do the follow ups. Um, <clears throat> all right, so here this is what hopefully you learned or took away from today's session was uh, create uh, the the environment for Defender for Endpoint, how to onboard, and then ultimately how to configure some of those devices at least at a high level. This was uh, not an in depth uh, conversation for the period of time that we had, but hopefully that you saw us, we were able to go and accomplish those things and meet those. Um, go ahead and uh, go to the next slide for me, Jackson. And I then just lastly, reminded, uh, about the course again. Yep, here is the course. If you needed to go through and follow that, if you go through all the way to the end, you get a little badge saying that you completed the course, and that is uh, that is perfect. Uh, yeah, and then of course keep enjoying um, Ignite. There are plenty of more sessions, and for me, thanks so much for joining this session. I hope you guys are walking away now with some good more knowledge around Defender for Endpoint. All right. Well, I think we're going to wrap up our we are uh, we are over. So thank everyone for attending and uh, we appreciate your time. And hopefully we'll go through and make sure all the questions have been answered inside of the Q&A. All right. Thank you. OK, thanks very much.